So, multiple degrees of freedom, like I said, it's the process of modal analysis. Okay, so instead of looking at the actual displacements, we look at the modes, we focus on the modes, and there's a, there's a good reason for doing that. When you've got multiple degrees of freedom with forcing functions, okay, um, you can use this method to solve for the displacement. But the big advantage is it allows you to uncouple the equations of motion. Okay, um, we'll talk about that in a second, and that, and that makes it an awful lot easier to solve. And there's a step-by-step -step procedure um, to follow. Okay, which is which you'd always do. Um, so. So with modal analysis, well, before we start on modal analysis, the equation of motion for a linear multiple degrees of freedom system with no damping follows this form. Okay, this is the uh, mass matrix. We've got acceleration, stiffness matrix, displacement, and then there's your forcing function. Okay, that you've covered last year. That we covered in chapter five. This is a matrix form with a multiple degrees of freedom. That that um, if it's if the system is linear, it will always follow that format. Now the problem is, K is not a diagonal matrix. When I mean a diagonal matrix, I mean there's only terms in the diagonal of that matrix. All the other terms around that, um, mat all the other terms that are, that are not on the diagonal, if you've got a spring between the masses, there's going to be a value in that term. It's not going to be zero. So K is not, is not diagonal, okay? And that means that the motion of the different uh, masses in your system are coupled together, okay? The motion of mass one will be affected by the motion of mass two, and the motion of mass two might be affected by the motion of mass three, and and so on, okay? Um, and the and the that, because of that, if you apply Newton's second law to get these equations, okay, um, the problem is is you'll end up with um, x one and x two and x three terms in all the equations, as opposed to just dealing with one of those terms. And because they're coupled together, you've got to solve them simultaneously. Okay, and the problem with simultaneous equations is that when you start getting more than two or three variables in the equations that, that you have to solve for, um, it gets very difficult. Okay, so, and are, again, these are differential equations, and that's like I said, that's problematic. But modal analysis allows you to uncouple them, and the way we start with modal analysis is we apply the substitution. Okay, we've got x equals phi which is a matrix, a modal matrix, which we'll find in a minute, and then Q. And Q is known as the modal coordinate or the modal variable. And so you stick that substitution into our equation of motion, and we end up with this. Okay, obviously here we've got, when you've got x double dot, this just becomes Q double dot, so that's what we've got phi Q double dot in there. So I've replaced that in here, and then down here we've got K times phi times by Q equals the force. Now, if we apply a trick, which is pre-multiplying by the transpose of phi, okay, something interesting happens. If you've got phi correct, okay, if you've determined the terms in phi correctly, then that first term, okay, phi transpose times by m times by phi, okay, will give you the identity matrix. Okay, so it's a diagonal matrix, and the only things in the diagonal are what is one. Okay, so you've got one, 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 one down the middle. Okay, all the other terms are zero. So essentially, that term becomes one. So you end up with just q double dot. That second term, phi transpose times by k times by phi. Again, if you've got the values of phi correctly, this simply becomes a diagonal matrix. Okay, with omega i squared down the middle. Omega 1 squared, omega 2 squared, omega 3 squared, all the other terms are zero. And what that means is that these equations will therefore be un completely uncoupled. Okay? If we're dealing with Q1, okay, so we have Q1 double dot plus omega 1 squared times by Q1, all the other terms are zero in the first row. So the, you, know, you could have Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. They're all multiplied by zero. So the equation is completely uncoupled. Okay? We're only dealing with Q1 and, and Q2 and so on. So instead of having, you know, for an n degree of freedom system, you'd have n coupled equations, okay? But 
with modal analysis, we've manipulated the equation by making a substitution, and we've ended up with n number of uncoupled equations. And uncoupled equations means that we can solve them individually, you can solve them quickly, and you can do it by hand. Both this and this are both matrices, and they're both diagonal matrices. And like I said, that allows you to have uncoupled equations. So the equation becomes, if we go back, like I said, this is 1, this bit is omega i squared, so taking one of the equations, so I've called it the ith mode, there we are, q double dot i plus omega i squared times by qi equals pit. Now the p bit is basically that last term. I wish I had the, uh, I wish I had the remote, but I don't seem to have the remote. But basically this term up here, there's p, and that equals the transpose of phi times by my forcing function. So that's where the p bit comes from at the end. So that's the equation. And if you've got an undamped system, okay, and you correctly calculate phi, your equation will always be in that form, okay, where your forcing function, depends on what forcing function was given to you, will be over this side. It will always be in that form. So it's the second order differential equation. Now, you're thinking, okay, well, that's fair enough. What do we do? Well, we've already done a bunch of second order differential equations. And in fact, in chapter 3, I've written chapter 2 here, but in chapter 3, we solved this for a whole bunch of different forcing functions, if you remember. Okay? We had a step forcing function, a ramp function, a decaying exponential, a sinusoid. We even had an offset sinusoid. And in, you know, if you look at uh, the Fourier series stuff in Chapter 4, we solved it for those as well. Okay? That's just another, basically another set of sinusoids. So we solved this equation of motion before. Now, okay, well, they're, they're, they, they are different. Here I've got x, here I've got q, but in fact, they're exactly the same format. And so what you can do is you can match them up together. Okay, so here's my, the one we solved before, and here's my modal equation. You can see quite clearly that if I, you know, q and x, they're both the variable I'm interested in solving for. m, in this case, is 1. k, in this case, is omega i squared. Okay. And f, in this case, is p. And so, you, like I said, you match them up. m is 1. k is omega i squared. f of t is p i of t. And omega naught, which is the natural frequency, is obviously omega i, which is also the natural frequency that you found. So you take the standard solution, which is on your equation sheet, and you basically make the substitutions in there. So for example, if I had a, let's assume that p was a step forcing function, a constant term. Well, I look up my equation sheet and I know that I've got the solution to this equation, which is this. That's on the equation sheet. Okay, so if I make the substitution in there, Every time an M pops up, there isn't an M in this solution, but I would put 1 in. Obviously, here I stick in my P, and here I stick in my omega I squared, and over here I stick in my omega I. And so, quite clearly, for Q1, I've got P1 over omega 1 squared, times by 1 minus cosine omega 1 T, and Q2 is P2 over omega 2 squared, times by 1 minus omega 2 times by T, and so on. Okay? So you simply make the substitution. This is math, basically. This is the mathematical solution to this, assuming that x and x dot of 0 is 0, assuming initial rest conditions. Okay? It's just math. That's an equation. That's the solution to that equation. So this is that. This is an equation. And that, we know, is the solution to this equation. Okay? We've just, basically, we've just adapted our solutions that we found for this, for this purpose. Let's assume we had a ramp function, ft. Okay, we went again, we went through on your equation sheet, we solved for the what happens when you've got a linearly increasing force, and that was the solution that we found. Minus f upon k times omega naught, sine omega naught t plus ft upon k. And so, with our modal equation in the same format, we've got pi t here. Okay, so that, that we, know, we know, therefore, we're dealing with a ramp function. And you can simply substitute the things in. 
k is omega i squared, okay? And obviously, omega i squared times by omega i is omega i cubed, okay? And obviously, p1 instead of f, p1 times t upon omega i squared, and so on. And you just make the substitutions in, you get the solution. And I could go on, I could look at decaying exponential, I could look at the sinusoid, and it's all the same thing. Basically, you just make those substitutions in. M is 1, K is omega i squared, and P and F are matched up, and you'll get the solution. Obviously, what you're going to do is take a look at the forcing function and make a decision about which one of these is the solution. Okay? It's quite clear that if I've got the T here, it's linearly increasing as time goes up, so will the force, the total force. If there's no t there, then it's going to be a constant term, okay? And obviously, if there's an exponential in terms of t, then obviously that's a decaying exponential. Uh, you know, terms the e to the minus something, that's going to be a decaying exponential, okay? And then obviously, uh, um, if you've got a cosine sign, then you know it's quite clearly it's a sinusoid, and so you use that solution. And that will obviously give you answers for q1, q2, and so on. And what you do is you make your substitution, again using that equation, and you'll get your displacements back. The question is, what is phi? This is obviously quite an important key to unlocking this whole situation, okay? But we need to know what phi is. So how do we go about finding out what phi is? Well, this is where that step-by-step -step process comes in. Steps one to three are the three things you've already done in chapter five and you did last year. You find the equation of motion, okay, in matrix form. You solve for the natural frequencies and then you find your mode shapes. That's the three steps, okay? You did that last year. And it's not really the focus of what we're doing here. Step four is where the focus starts coming in. You find the modal mass. This is the equation, okay? This is my modal mass. So if I've got two modes of the system, I'm going to have two modal masses. Three modes or three natural frequencies, I'm going to have three modal masses, and so on, okay? Mi. And what you do is you take your mass matrix, which is there, so that's the math matrix for my equation of motion. This is the first mode shape. And you pre-multiply it by the transpose of your first mode shape. And you multiply them out together using matrix multiplication. You'll end up getting one value, because you've got a, a 1 by 2 here, a 2 by 2, and a 2 by 1. You multiply them together, you get one value, and you end up getting the modal mass. You can do the same thing to find the modal stiffness, but we don't actually need the modal stiffness because of what we do in step five. We rescale it. And rescaling, basically, we've got our mode shape here. We divide it by a constant, which is this one here. And so we end up with a new mode shape. Their mode shapes are identical in terms of their, you know, their ratio, their relative motion of each other. This one, we tend to normalize x1 to be 1 and x2 will be whatever it is in relation to x, you know, in relation to 1. Well, this is exactly the same ratio, except for x1 won't be 1. It'll be some value that's probably less than 1, assuming this is greater than 1. <coughs> so you rescale. So you could do that for your yeah, x number, n number of modes. And so here I've got u1, u2, and so on. And what you do is you basically, to get phi, you just drop them in. Okay? You'll have a, another vector here, because that's two values, or three values, or whatever. Um, divide, you divide each one of those by the square root of m, you'll get another vector that's the same length as this one. And you just drop them in. Okay? So if you've got two, then obviously you're going to have one. You're gonna, that's going to have two values in. You've got one, two, one, two. You end up with a two by two matrix, which is phi. Again, three, you'd have a... 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, so you'd end up with a 3 by 3 matrix, and so on. So your matrix will just grow up, and it will be n by n in terms of the number of terms inside that matrix. And that's phi. That's your key. So that's step 5. Like I said, to deal with the applied force, which is step 6, you can see quite clearly that we've got, you know, this is our equation that we had earlier. P is going to be the, the transpose of phi times by f. And so you apply that formula to deal with the applied force. Step six, okay. So you take your phi, you transpose it, which means all the diagonal terms stay the same, but you swap 
the terms that are off the diagonal with each other. You multiply that by your forcing function to get a vector of, of a modal forces. And then you just use this equation. Okay, You don't need to derive the equation in any way. This is the form of the equation. Okay, We saw that this bit here is 1. This bit here is omega i squared, assuming you've got phi correct. And obviously your forcing function, you just use this equation to plug it into there. And if f of t is a, a linear increasing force, then p of t will also be a linear increasing force, okay? Because you're just multi multiplying it by a number, okay? And those numbers are contained within your modal matrix. So you've got your equation for q, and then you solve for it, okay? And again, that involves, that will involve going to the equation sheet and finding the solution. And then you simply make the substitution to find out what x is. Okay. If you've got damping in your system, then the equation is slightly different. Your modal equation will look like this. So you've got this additional term in the middle. Okay, assuming your damping is proportional to a linear combination of your mass and your stiffness, okay, proportional damping, then you'll have this term in the middle, and zeta is simply the damping ratio for that mode. And we'll, yeah, if you do have a damping problem, you'll see that the question, uh, question six in your notes does involve damping, and I've given you, in the, in the solution of the question, I've given you the damping ratio. Okay. But it's worth, an, worth being aware of the form of that equation. So like I said, step-by-step -step process. Steps one, two, and three you've done before. Step one, find the equation of motion. Step two, find the natural frequencies using the mechanical impedance matrix. Step three is the mode shapes. Step four is where we start going into this new, new material, find the modal mass. Okay. Step five, rescale to unit modal mass and find the modal matrix. Step six, you deal with the applied force. That means you'll end up then, then end up with your equation, your modal equation, <coughs> okay, which are independent of each other. Solve for them, and then convert back to displacements to get your final solution. <laughs>